up in the sky at the birds that play. Jason J. Lewis, the voice of Superman on Justice League Action. And you're listening to The Krypton Report. Welcome to The Krypton Report Podcast. I am your host, Tyler, the Superman of Blue, the man of tomorrow. And with me is my partner in crime, the Superman of Red, the man of steel himself, Mr. James Colt. Welcome, James. Hey, what's going on? Yeah. James, 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 James. <laughs> uh, we, uh, I clicked on search for Superboy on the Roku the other day just, you know, to see, but because I'm pretty sure it wasn't streaming anywhere. The only place you, the only thing you can do is buy it. Um, but then it said that George Reeves was, um, was on there and I clicked on it and it didn't go to George Reeves. It took me to Fleischer. All right. And I was like, well, doesn't know okay. what it has. Okay. Uh, it's, I mean, I've always had good, you know, good luck and everything with it, but just in this particular instance, searching for Superboy, and I was scrolling through all the super stuff that was there and George Reeves was there. And I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? I'll throw that on for a minute. You know, I'll watch an episode of this or whatever, and then I'll throw in the DVD and of Superboy, and then I'll watch that. And I turn it on, and it was Fleischer. I'm like, all right, well, I'll watch the Bulleteer, and then I'll put on Superboy. <laughs> I, I, you know what? It just bums me out that uh, we are at a we are at a time where we just don't have. Um, you know, it was on Tubi, and it's gone. And DC Universe, and I miss DC Universe. I really do. Like I miss just put turning on an app that had all my DC content because we know like it, there for a while it was all on Max, but then over time Max has been selling stuff off, so now it's back to where stuff is all over the place. Um, and they don't have all of that stuff that was there. They had every, they had almost everything there. They had unaired pilots. They had old shows 70s shows you know they had movies tv game like it was yeah there was so much available concentrated on dc and, and so just, much of that is missing from max yeah i miss they don't even have swamp thing over there yeah swamp thing is on tv right now isn't it i believe so yeah and i'm just like it's it's very frustrating because that was the whole like selling post, like an excitement of being like, oh, all of our stuff in one place together. And now it's it's not. And I mean, it was cool to sit back and go panel by panel most of the time through, on a comic, most on a of TV. your comics on your TV. You could just sit back and go panel by panel. But when they had those long ones that went up like the whole side of the page, and it was just like this one streak down the middle of your screen. And you couldn't read it. It's frustrating. Just because that one panel. That that happens on your phone or your tablet too. And then you have to like zoom into the words and stuff. But. It's just. I don't know. I'm. I'm, I I miss that. I just. Because I also like. Do you remember when DC Universe had. Like they did specials. Where they did like little documentaries. They did Mm -hmm. one for Aquaman. They did one for Shazam. Because of the movies. And like. I don't know. It was really cool. Like they were doing a lot of neat stuff, but it was like the early DC studios. Almost, yeah. You know, and I, w- I wish they would bring something back. I wish they'd bring some of that stuff back, you know, and even if you do put it on max and make it or something, you know, like, I don't know. You just, I mean, I'm happy with the, the, I'm I'm usually pretty happy with the DC universe app as it is, you know, as the comic reader. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Max is still producing a lot of DC content over there and yeah, there's, got the DC yep. studios going. It's actually begun. And- I must say, speaking of which, good segue, James, good job. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have December 5th premiere as the premiere date for Creature Commandos. Yay. Yay. <laughs> I think this this spooky season that we're in right now, I think I'm going to try to read some creature commandos or like agents of shade kind of thing. I think I'm going to um mm. I'm going to kind of read some of those comics. 
there is a comic and I'm going to try to uh, reread for anyone. There is on the app, there's Frankenstein. I think it's called Superman monster. It's basically like if Superman was the Frankenstein monster, I read it last year. Yeah. Um, It's a really great read. If you love those old classic um, characters. Uh, But I'm, I'm interested in the, um, what do you call it? The, the creature community. I was just looking something up real hard to convert. As of this recording, the final season of season one, which I project would probably end up being the only season of Kite Man, has dropped. So that series is completely now on Max. We're talking about Max Com. Ooh, nice. I might have to finish and the, that. And then uh, later this week, we will get Penguin, and it's getting a lot of good reviews. And I'm excited for Penguin and just the growth of the Matt Reeves crime drama saga Batman universe. Yeah. My, my, okay. Since we're going to go into, since you're going to bring that up, going into that, have you seen the things that came out about, um, this is the, this takes place a week after the first one. And then in the subsequent weeks, it starts like a week after the first, and then it's the subsequent weeks after that. But then it goes, uh, but then it leads into the Batman two, yep. which is supposed to take place like a week or whatever after the penguin ends. So, my my question is, with the condensed timeline for the story and then the time it takes to create these projects and put them out, like, are these people going to be around? Are they going to be doing this? How long is this going to go? And is this going to be like a, uh, a Dark Knight trilogy scenario where we, mo- a little more expanded, but a Dark Knight trilogy scenario where we are on a condensed timeline where... Batman does this thing and there's like a beginning, middle and an end. I wonder, uh, do you because think, are we going to have that or I've something wondered I was about thinking that? about because of that condensed timeline? Cause Matt Reeves said he has a trilogy planned for the Batman. That's, a, that's their goal, which is fine. Which is great. You know? And then I think, okay, like what you just said, it says, this is the clip. The Batman takes place a week after the conclusion of the penguin during the winter. So Penguin, if you think about it, the Batman starts on Halloween and goes to what, like November 2nd or something like that? Like, yeah, it's, it's only a couple it's of only... days. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the Penguin is taking place. The series is like through November into December. Um, you know, so it's going to be like you said, those it says the Penguin story plays out over the next weeks that take you towards the end of the year. We don't play. We don't play Christmas or New Year's, but we are. But we're getting there. Uh, so it takes us into the winter. The Batman two will take place in winter. And then what do you do a second season of the penguin? Do you, or do like, you do somebody else who, but, a, a, seri- a, a series, a right. series focused on another villain? And my I question mean, with that is we already know that they wanted to do uh, once again, oh, we're going to do the Gotham central type show that never gets off the ground for some reason. You know, they talked about doing an Arkham Asylum show that never gets that off the ground. recently got canceled. So my thing would be do a mini series that's kind of a blend of those, but don't become like Gotham, you know, and we're going to be talking about Gotham later this month, but do a show that's kind of a mixture of the Arkham and the CD. Cause if you're going to continue this story, but then let's say the Batman two ends, it's it, it's in winter, you know, and it takes a place over a couple of days or whatever. So where does the Batman three take place? Because I don't want another, like you said, time gap where like like with the Nolan series, it's like Batman begins. For the most part, that story takes place at a set time frame. And then uh, the Dark Knight's like a year later. Yeah. And then and then after the Dark Knight, we jump eight years. Yeah. So I want if the Batman ends, but in that subsequent, in, but in those eight years, he did nothing. Right, because he was hiding and, you know, because they were hunting him. Yeah. So my question is, with the Batman, would it be, if this ends in winter, do we then just jump a couple weeks later, like in spring? You know what I'm saying? And we do uh, the final film. And then it means that this whole story of Batman takes place in year two into year three. Yeah. So, so 
thinking on that and thinking about things that we discussed with the Batman, um, the idea of that we had of potential t- small time jumps between films or, you know, time filled in with the series or whatever. And the idea that Batman, because he was like so bare bones in the Batman, mm-hmm. that his tech and his methods would evolve. Like we discussed him inventing the smoke bombs and, you know, a couple other things I can't think of off the top of my head, but just ideas we had about how crude it was, how he could at this stage evolve into more of a Batman that we know on screen in this, in this universe. So are we not going to really get that because it's so, because it's a sh- so short amount of time or are, is it just going to happen because it, you know, it was like potential to build upon and then it's just going to happen because that's how it was in, in the Batman, which I did love was they didn't, they didn't feel the need to explain everything. If it was mm-hmm. there because Batman needed to use it, it was there because that's what he used and that was yeah. it. And that's fine. I, I actually prefer that. Um, also, do you think do you think that as comic book fans, we look for like continuation of series? I mean, we get stories with beginning, middle, and end, but we also know that the character is returning. Whereas in the movies, there is a potential end to where these actors don't want to play this character anymore, things like that. So they want to give them a beginning, middle, and end to their to their on screen stories. Do you think as comic book fans we're we're weary about how they're going to end a story. I would say um, yes. And I would look at it like this without, too, with, because, without them coming back again. <laughs> I think you have two minds because with the combo, we like continual stories. I mean, that was, you know, we, we go back to the Nolan trilogy. Like people argued because that had a beginning, a middle and end. And that was his Batman story. And like, Oh, that's not what Batman would do. But in this context, yes, I say we look at, I still don't think the stopping for eight years would be something that Batman would do, but but he could cheat. Also, the the goal was to get rid of crime, and that was what the Harvey Dent Act was for, and it did work. So, I mean, in the context of the story, I suppose the Nolan the Nolan Batman was never the boy by the candlelight pledging to be a bat and rid Gotham of crime. Yeah, because I think you need that you need that child mindset as the initiation of it, because only a child would think I can like that 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 i can do this yeah carry that psychosis in to being an adult i think one tv has evolved okay and i say that because go back and look at the anthology movies you know they were built almost like long tv where this is a movie but we can continue it this is a movie but the storytelling wasn't that tight that you know you can watch almost batman batman returns batman forever batman and robin almost without having seen the one before it because so much changed each film that there wasn't a, a, a narrative through now when they're doing the films, there's this stronger narrative overarching between movies. I also look back at the James Bond franchise, which had the ability to continually reboot and go on like with the different bonds. We just accepted it and went through it until we got to Daniel Craig where they went to that modern day storytelling of tighter through line and made a quadrilogy, right? It's just quantum of solace specter. Is it four or five films that Craig? Did? Uh, I think he was in four. I've only seen two of them. Hold on. Casino Royale. Quantum of solace. Yeah. Uh, there was sky skyfall specter. And then specter. the last one. So we did five. So he did. Oh, did a, he? Uh, okay. Pint- I did not Pint- see. The, I did not see the last two, maybe three. I don't think I saw Skyfall. Skyfall is good. The only one I'm for sure I saw was Casino Royale, and then I saw the second one. If that is Quantum of Solace, I don't. Yeah, know. and Qua- and right there is the <laughs> first time that Quantum of Solace was the first time they did a Bond movie that was a direct sequel to the last Bond movie because Quantum picks up at the final moments of Casino Royale. Yeah. So that so you take that franchise which has lasted for decades. And how they did that franchise. And there's always been a, a kind of linear, there's this comparison between Batman and Bond of how they do things. If you look at the structures and the characters. <clears throat> so all that to be said with, with the Batman, once again, we're looking at a character that 
where will they end him? Because you don't want to do what Nolan did just again. But, you know, do you want to keep, do you want to end it where Batman's continuing his mission, but like there's some sort of high point where it ends? Because we, we we're going to, we were going to a conclusion, I guess, you know, because that's the way this is structured as a trilogy. It's not made to continue on. And in a way, I kind of would hope that maybe with the Batman Brave and the Bold, we find a way to continue just to make these films back to being a little bit where they just continue on and we change out actors. I mean, you, you changed out Q for James Bond with a new Q because of how the story, you know, and like with Alfred, or you get to a point where you don't have Alfred like they do in the comics and you have the Batman continue and you change out Batman and like, you just keep making Batman films without yeah, having just to constant need... stories where each story has a beginning, middle, and end, but not like the character overall. There's not this super overarching like narrative idea. to where yeah. you can, um, that is a fun idea because it would be nice to get back to that. So you don't feel like we're having this hard reboot with a because trilogies. If we sat down and had a whole conversation about Star Wars. Lord of the Rings, even though Lord of the Rings are based off a book, I think it's a little bit different, but the idea of like Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, um, you know, the Nolan trilogy and we like the Godfather trilogy, we, we start breaking down the patterns of a trilogy, the beginning, the middle chapter, the end, you start to see those patterns. They become almost, you have to try to reinvent it, but you're still doing kind of the similar beats to it in a trilogy uh, with the right. third film reaching back, you know, and touching on the first film and stuff like that. Right. Um, yeah, that'd be interesting. I really am. Um, I really am a, a, I guess I'm just born, bred a, a comic book fan. Cause I'm really a saga kind of person, you know, I've always, I've always preferred director's cuts, more story, you know, different mm-hmm. edits, more character moments, um, sagas, you know, where there's multiple entries, um, where the world really builds out and fills up, um, you know, Lord of the Rings, the trilogy was amazing. And um, I mean, do I think that the rest of everything that's come out has reached the heights that that did? No, but I really do enjoy them filling out the world, creating the, uh, creating the narrative, filling in gaps, um, you know, the Hobbit, uh, like, one thing I really appreciated about the movies was them using those times that Gandalf does disappear in the book as times to fill in the saga story, you know, Mm -hmm. creating what that he's been researching this for, for decades, for like probably near a hundred years. He's been um, like weary of this kind of uprising and return you know, um, and, and, you know, him getting closer and confirmed on those things. I thought those, that was really interesting. And, uh, I haven't started rings of power season two yet, but we just were talking about that the other day about doing it, how we, they Jeanine take I... some of the mythology of the Cimmerillion to, mm-hmm. to build the, uh, to build the rings of power before the, before Sauron was in power, before the, the war of the rings 3000 years ago, you know, me and I decided that because of spooky season and like, we got hooked on watching uh penny dreadful yeah, and, and some stuff. We were like, you know what? We're just going to hold rings of power until November when it's complete and just watch it. And the same things with um, only murders in the building, the new season. Okay. We're just like, cause we really enjoy that. But being the mystery, it's more fun. Like when we watched the first season, for the first two seasons, you know, we were able to binge it. Um, so it was like, it was more enjoyable that way than, you know, spread out. So those are series we decided that we're just going to hold off till about November when they're wrapped up and then just watch them. Mm, yeah, but this is a Superman sense. podcast. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, we well, really, we really went on a heavy tangent there. It's, really don't have it's, a whole lot it really came, it. it really came from Batman. I mean, September, <laughs> like I've, I've joked before. September, yeah, there's Batman Day, but I really kind of just use September as a month to celebrate Batman um, because it is my second, you know, favorite DC hero and second favorite character. And I do love the Batman character and the world. Um, <clears throat> so we really kind of put a lot of focus on Batman in the house and everything in September. Uh, but I, I do want to throw this out there. It's not really uh, – there was an article through Deadline that said that Superman and Lois's plan was originally to go for seven seasons. 
And you know what? As exciting as that is, part of me always worries um, just because, like, keeping that high quality, you know. Um, but I think if you would have had the right people, maybe seven seasons could have worked. Is if you have the if you have the strength with TV, one of the biggest problems is you tell characters stories they're, they out, and then you have characters that outlast their story and their need on a show, but you don't ever want to drop those characters and those actors. So they just keep them and trying to find something for them to do. Yeah. And that's really, I think when the stories suffer. Well, you, that's also going back to TV when it was 20 plus episodes a season and they just kept, you know, and they'd sign people on for the majority of the season. And just to put them in there, they had to come up with a reason. And it was always some sort of dramatic irony for them mm-hmm. to be around, you know, or they'd repeat stories, you know, just because, uh, you know, because it was a different writer and they told the same story as somebody else before. Um, but the, uh, the, the shorter seasons that they have, you know, the idea that, did they have, did they have ideas that far through, you know, did, did they have those ideas that far through where, um, where they would, uh, they would have something to say the entire time, um, you know, cause a, a lot of the time they don't do, they don't have those ideas planned ahead until they get picked up. <laughs> yeah. You know, then- and then, so I'm just kind of like, all right, but just give us a strong last season. And I think, I, I think I would have liked maybe one more season, but yeah, you know, it, we, we kind of, good. we kind of speculated that we feel like Superman and Lois was going to end before Superman, the movie, like we kind of, the, the timetable is a little off, but we kind of speculated that it would end before that uh, yeah. film would take off. So uh, well, if and also if we didn't have this restructuring at DC and DC Studios, would would this keep going a little bit longer? I don't know, but you know, a good strong final season. I'd rather go off on a high note than you know linger. And then the last quick thing is just I've seen speculation. Superman homepage wrote a whole thing about uh, their idea and context clues of maybe seeing a trailer teaser trailer for Superman in December. And then others have speculated online that we might see it February 9th for the Super Bowl, much like we did with the Flash. So I just thought that was just kind of worth mentioning. I mean, I think they're both kind of sound theories um, of when we might see a teaser trailer for this film. Um, I definitely, I definitely want to see a teaser like about, you know, six months out kind of thing. And then a full trailer. So like, give me a teaser, like in December. Give me the first trailer like in February, March. And then don't over, you know, don't give me like 13 trailers and TV spots and everything that reveals yeah. too much. They're going to market the hell out of this movie. Um, kicking I mean, it up. They're going to market the hell out of this movie. I hope, <clears throat> I just hope, you know, well, the idea here is we certainly did not have the production that you know our last tentpole film had (laughs) um the that super lengthy production and the idea of keep it in everybody's everybody's mind the entire time so just keep giving them stuff over and over and over again um i i think that they i think that some people might know that how quick the turnover is in theaters Mm -hmm. that if you start hyping it too early like I think I think the first time we see anything would probably be February the Super Bowl because that's 5 months. That's plenty of time to to hype up the movie, not give up not give up too much and and us to see the things because I think if they start doing it in December and then and then they don't give us something until February, March, I don't know, that's going to be I don't think we're going to see anything until I think the Super Bowl really. See, and I, I'm kind of with you on that because I don't want to, I don't want them to oversell it. I don't want to, you know, too much, but I, I do want to see them put some uh, their effort behind it. I just don't do screenings like they did with the flash. Like they over marketed the flash yeah, and they did all those free screenings for fans who were already going to come. Like you lost how much money you think on those screenings. Yeah. Well, let's think, 
let's yeah. think about um let's think about this. The last time Superman was in people's purview was Henry Cavill and Justice League. Let's just, Justice let's, League the the DCE the theater. He was kind yeah. of like the face, you know, of DC. Well, you're doing Superman again. He's the face of DC and DC has had a really harsh record over the last decade. So you can't think like us, okay? Like Yeah, but as the general audience, some people might see that and like but then they see something new. Well, I mean, like, you think about it. Most how, how do you, general audiences how do you market it aren't going to follow everything that we do. No, no, I know. So think about so just think but about But think about the general audience's reaction to DC. It was it was in decline, especially post uh, Justice League, except for Aquaman. So I mean, yeah, I'm just saying, like we look back at what we've had in theaters, there hasn't been anything because some people might have went and saw Black Adam, and then that was it. You know, they didn't stay after like for any post credit scene or anything, and um. Their 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 relevance of Superman is oh that last Justice League film because they didn't follow the news they're not watching it on TV you know there's not the hubbub like we have where we're like oh we got this and this and you know Tyler is on TV they're just like no what what are you talking about so this is a big deal to have this back. Honestly, it's like the it's like the time Superman Returns came out, and then the time Man of Steel came out. It's like your first solo Superman movie. Like everybody's going to see Superman, and they're going to want to go and see it as a movie. You know, that's the importance that we need. And and then it and then it just needs the good word of mouth. I think to really to really grow. I think it would be neat if they like had like a a fan screening like an advanced fan screening like maybe one night for certain fans in certain areas or something and that be it you know um just kind of the build that word of mouth between people like us and stuff who are going to be really out there you know going for it get all of us dc podcasters Send us well, to I mean, screening. I mean, <laughs> Let us watch it, and then we all go on and say spoiler free, and just say go see the damn movie because it's amazing. Well, it's like okay when BVS came out. Okay, for example, Janine and yeah. I just for fun signed up when they had the big marketing push and went to the theater to watch the trailer release. Okay, we went to the movie theater and just watched a two minute trailer. Afterwards, there was a rep there who gave us posters we got posters uh and then took our information and then the following year when the film was released we got email invite to see the movie three days or four days before release hmm. so uh we saw bbs that monday um before the general public saw the release that thursday night nice you know and i had just started podcasting um at that time so i didn't have you know as much of the references and everything and people that we do now so i'm like if you did something like that for people who are part of you know your your audience that might really help just boost it but let's get into today's com uh first we're doing superboy season one episode eight the fixer now, I've watched this one, but it's been a little bit just because this week we were supposed to record earlier, um, so my brain's a little foggy and everything. It's been a long week. Solomon has been in his play, and I've had to take him. I basically had to make the same drive three times, three trips, so that's a there and back almost three times um, some days, and you know, usually two days because it's right by where I work, but because of the timing, I have to come home, get him, take back, and... We're all exhausted in this house. But <laughs> right. season one, episode eight, Clark discovers that Luther is trying to fix some of the school's basketball games so that he makes a killing in betting. And the way he does is that is that he has a photo of the team star player in a com- compromising position that 
it got out, it would ruin his career. All right. The fixer, James. Did you think it was funny watching Superboy fly around a high school gym blowing his whistle? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I was um, probably like, I was like, then, man, this is just nothing else for Super. I mean, it feels almost like something crazy that the old Silver Age Superboy comics would pull. But in the context of this show, it's just kind of like, oh, that's rough. Yeah. Uh, it, it was it was pretty hilarious, him just coming in. Um, I, I think it was so, I think it was funny, Clark um, running the, running the, the referee off. So he never, never ref any game anywhere ever again. And then he's like, yeah, sure. He just <laughs> took off. Um, and then Superboy, yeah, uh, fair play and uh, the the compromising photo. Oh no, a college athlete was smoking. <laughs> that's, I thought that's it was a... hilarious. Um, now you have to make like something horrible. Like it would really be something where you have to go. Oh my gosh, that's what are you doing to really like sell that same kind of theme of like compromising photo. Like yeah, more people, because almost everything now we're just like, yeah, <laughs> like that's not compromising. A college athlete smoking a joint? No, no, that's not compromising in the least. That's expected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, like, oh, he, he's. I mean, now it's like everything is legal. It, what did What did you think about Lex's villainy in this episode being a a fixer? You know. I mean, making people really, throw games to to win bets. It really like makes you question like this Lex, like where his origins come from, where his uh, just in general like this isn't the rich boy Lex. <clears throat> Our friend Anthony over at Digging for Kryptonite had a really good uh, head canon of like the story of this Lex Luthor of where he came from because of just behaviors and stuff like this, where it's like. You're you're fixing basketball games because why? Like yeah, you know why? he's he's this is like your Zach Morris type Lex Luthor is really what this is. Yeah, um, and I don't know. I just it doesn't feel like Lex. Like even like oh college Lex. I mean, it is a very very dramatically different. Yeah. Um, I did think it was I did think it was good at least in the fact in the respect like he tried to get this one guy to do it and he ultimately decided not to but then he had somebody else on his payroll and then he had somebody else on his payroll (laughs) you know I mean it is very Lex to have a backup to your backup you know yeah to have some some different angles thought out but yeah that was other than that I mean you know, I mean, it wasn't a horrible episode. It was, it, it was funny here and there. Um, you know, I, I do, I do think it is funny uh, that Superboy comes in to ref the game. You know, I think it was pretty hilarious. Uh, I got a good chuckle, but it, it was something I couldn't. I know, I know that the character would do in in some respect. You know, but I couldn't take it seriously. Yeah. I, I absolutely that's... know that Superman or Superboy would, but I just couldn't take it seriously in Superboy. <laughs> it's very hard. Like this episode's tough because it's so like low stakes and almost ridiculous now. Like I don't want to say dumb, but like this is like this is almost lower than like plot wise than like a Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah. Like and it's not even like it's a like professional game or like there's some big something big behind it. It's just so uh, it's just so low. I do like that the actor who played Coach. Did you recognize the actor who played the coach? The dad from Teen Wolf. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, there. A little cry. It would have been, kind of, been awesome if he was Coach uh, Scott. Um, oh crap! What was his name? And I, I'm I'm mixing up Teen Wolf the movie and Teen Wolf the TV show because they changed the the last name in the. Howard in the TV so show, it was it was uh, Howard in Teen Wolf, and he's uh, just listed as coach. But like, if it would have been Coach Howard in this, oh yeah, awesome. 
Yeah, because he, he was he, his name was Howard. He was his dad. Like he, like um, he's yeah, like, yeah, my son Howard. inspired me to be a basketball coach. Like that's all right. I needed. That's all I needed. <laughs> be like continuity. <laughs> what would have been? What would have been funny is if Superboy was refing the game and then the Teen Wolf showed up, started dribbling yeah. the ball. <laughs> and then I, I probably would lose my mind, like because you know how much of a like Teen Wolf, like with Michael J. Fox, is like the closest like a modern day kind of Wolf Man type thing. And uh, I probably lost my mind. Right. Like, and then, and then, what what are the odds that back that back then in Superboy we would have a crossover of Superboy and Teen Wolf, and we've got Tyler Hoechlin from Teen Wolf, who is our Superman? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, who'd have thought that was the crossover we were getting? Uh, it would have been, it would have been great. Yeah, but. but it was. It's probably like the least. I mean, I'm looking at IMDb right now. It's ranking on IMDb is a five point six, and I think it's probably one of the. I'm looking. I'm just flipping through the season at the moment. It's the lowest episode of the season. There's one that comes close. There's two that comes close. Yeah. yeah. The, the the oh wait 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 wait. There is one episode twenty five of this season. Uh, uh, ranks lower, and it would be probably a good. We might skip ahead and do that episode next month because it's kind of Halloweenish. But um, okay, yeah, succubus. I was gonna say, how many episodes away? It's. I mean, it's. We're on episode seven. It's episode twenty-five. Oh, gee, yeah, we'll have to. We'd have to jump ahead on that one. But I'm just saying, like, we won't get there. <laughs> say it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, it doesn't. We don't have to do the exact production order. But all right, so, like, this is like I said. This is this is exactly like the lowest one where you're just kind of like, ah, okay, right. It, it it it's just one that it's almost it almost hurts to watch, but it is what it is. It's it's an enjoyable series. Our good buddy Nate McKenzie over at the Superman Animated Podcast is watching Superboy right now and he's in season two. Um it has its charms. But now it's time to move on, ladies and germs, to our comic discussion today. And we are be tackling now Action Comics Volume 4, Tired Hybrid. We now have a new creative team by Andy Diggle, Tony S. Daniels. Two with some, creative teams. <laughs> yeah, with Scott LaBelle and Tyler Kirkman. I've always liked Tony S. Daniels' artwork. Um, I'm pulling this up on my computer. I had it on my iPad, but then Sayla took my iPad before we started recording. And yeah. I always have horrible luck with uh, comics on my computer. Oh, lovely. Um, this is the but, worst time for her to steal it. <laughs> but it's keeping her entertained. But... The quick summary they have is determined to turn the people of Metropolis against the Man of Steel and finally vanquish him from the Earth. Lex Luthor unleashes a virus of Metropolis capable of rewriting the DNA of those infected, including Superman. While Superman's immune system eventually fights off the infection, but not before a hybrid Superman is created through the virus ability to rewrite DNA. This new hybrid Superman is the only being capable of defeating the true Superman and Lex will come at nothing to see it accomplish its mission. Collects Action Comics 19 through 24. And stories from Young Romance Cell, the New Fifty Two Number One, and Superman Annual Number Two. All right, and we're going to do instead of just going like issue by issue like we had before, we're just going to talk in general. Um, how did you feel about this? Just overall reading this. Um, you know, I I thought it was I didn't think it was too bad. Uh, I enjoyed it. The we finally got the story here um, of why Lex was in prison. Yes. Um, we got was... to see Lex in prison pretty early on in the Superman book. We, but we didn't know why. Like, And it definitely feels like... And they did say it was in action comics. You know, from the artwork and stuff, like the Lex appearance is definitely a departure from what we met. Um, what do you call it? In action, we also in learned Grant how... Morrison's yes. Run. We met... We we learn how uh, Lois meets John Carroll. Apparently, Lex decided to take care of his physical body 
after he met Superman. <laughs> I am I am going to pull up real quick here. I am going to share this one panel with uh, you real quick because yeah. this is actually a panel I love. Um, this just because yeah. so we're, we're starting to understand more of the suit, you know. And this is in this we see more of the suit because um, we actually get introduced to. Do- this is where we kind of get more about Doctor Veritas. You know who lives in the center of the earth. You know, yeah. Um, and I thought that was a, but what we're seeing is people like this where he, Superman stops this pilot and he he thinks it's Jimmy, and it's really not, and we start to see something that's going on, and I feel this is where we start to get more of the menacing scientist Lex that we know, compared to. Like Morrison's action Lex was definitely more of a throwback to um, previous like Lex Luthers, but we see that Superman starts like Lex has basically. As I'm trying to remember because I read all this like two weeks ago for us to record, but then yeah, we've he had to push he, this off. he engineers a a virus that's delivered with nanite probes um with a kryptonite shell so that way he can use this virus and the nanites to um rewrite superman's dna to kind of like control him Mm -hmm. and yeah and then it becomes this virus that replicates um like it creates its own uh like body and then it infects people and the the issue ends with Superman holding his hand as it's basically becoming its own thing. And then then we learn, like I said, Dr. Veritas. And then once again, um, we see this one panel I'm going to share because I think this is where we're learning about, like I said, this is really where I feel we learn the suit you know, because right here uh-huh. it said we see where she's giving him back his suit, and we see how it's just the shield that goes like on his chest, and then it expands when it grows with the bio suit. And I think, as much as I like that, I think it was a great way of like trying to explain how he can hide his suit under his clothes and and everything is like, oh, it's you know, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you have to have Clark Kent constantly in a trench coat because of his cape would be all baggy in his clothes and stuff. Like he'd look. <laughs> it's always it's always the cape and the boots are always the one for me. Like, how's he hiding that? Yeah. Even still, he'd be like he's got a big old gold belt and red underwear. If he stretched too far, you know, and his shirt came up. <laughs> means everything he wears has to be like a couple sizes too big. Right. <sighs> So that mutates, like I said, and creates a new form that Clark has to battle. And it, Dr. It, Veritas uses some red solar radiation to uh, weaken Superman and the creature because it's part of his DNA too. And then it kind of backfires on Lex because Superman beats the virus, but the virus is spreading like to regular people. And we get in this book later, Lex pulls a usual Lex Luthor where he um, shows up to save the day in his own like Lex armor, trying to defeat Superman, saying that Superman's the threat for this virus. He even has a really cool like hard light kryptonite dagger that forms from his armor that he tries to stab Superman with. And it's through this that they're able to, with with Lois and Jimmy's help, um, this is where we're able to prove what Lex did with the virus, like you said. And this is how he gets arrested. Which, you know, we were talking about when we were reading Superman. Um, where did Lex get arrested at? Like, where did that happen? So, Yeah, where did that happen? What did he do? Why is he in such a massive prison? And we're about to a we're about to a point, and this is we've kind of done this structurally, 
where we're going to stop action. And what we're going to do is we're going to read action and Superman in parallel because the last cup, the last two or three volumes of action Superman, we're going to kind of read them in parallel um, because what we've proven is that these, you can't really read just one title of this. Yeah, and well, be- with the stories later on, we see bits that jump in with Cywar. Yeah, you know, with, because like this Cywar. still wouldn't because because volume one of action and volume one of Superman, they don't line up. They don't no. start lining up until you get to act to volume four. Um, Wait, you have Cywar we're running into with uh, Hell on Earth and then Doomed is really where and we get the other titles that we're going to be exploring, which is the Superman and Wonder Woman title and how that all because the next part of this book is uh superman and wonder woman on a date and it is this kind of one-off issue where they fight the uh one of the greek gods the sirens and the sirens yeah yeah the and sirens uh uh control uh her her cousin eros yep and it it's this short little story and Superman and have to battle it. And then, like we said, we, we get the uh, atomic night, which plants into Psy war. And it's Hector Hammond reaching out to Clark. And this is where we're seeing the different art teams that are part of things. Um, because the shift to Clark in this, um, I'm pulling back here is Scott LaBelle and artist Tyler Kirkman now. And you can see because they, they draw Clark a little little less um, as rugged as before. And, you know, this is telling the story. Like, the best part of this is when people are, uh, when Clark and Kat are showing up and they pull the iPad to try to take their names. And like, oh, we don't see you on here and Clark uses his heat vision to basically destroy everyone's iPad. Yeah. Well, that was the, like, they use that to the iPad to like get in. Um, but it was, um, they promised uh, the, any interviews and whatnot to like the daily planet. And Clark basically like scorched the iPads of every other journalist in the area. So that way they're the only ones able to, actually receive the interview <laughs> not sure how i feel about that clark but you know what i'll allow it because uh i do like the artwork later on see, one today i know we see Clark <laughs> battling um in space because he's summoned uh by hector hammond and like this story like to me in a lot of ways as he's battling the atomic knights i don't really care about it because I already have a sense of what's going to happen because I had already read Cywar. And it's just a fun action space adventure that leads Clark on a mission that um, brings him, you know, he, he up against the, uh, what's his face? Psycho pirate with the Medusa mask. And that's why like, you know, we've, we've said before how much the New 52 was written for trades. But I'm going to kind of pull that back and think that that was written for certain characters. Because I know the Batman trade works really well. Like, and I mean, it even, you know, overlaps with Nightwing at times, like especially the first series. But yeah, the first cut, the first uh, whole arc. Yeah, like, but I'm, I'm you know, I've read a lot. But yeah, these, because uh, now see that we're in Psy War Part 2. And I, I, it's like, I, I appreciate these stories, but I'm like, at the same time, like, yeah, I'll, it was, it was almost more written for the event trades, right? Not, not, not the character trades, you know? And I'm, and I'm finding reading it like this. I'm actually a little bit more upset because I was enjoying the beginning of this book when I felt like I was reading a story, but now I'm just getting a, a book or two to something else that I have to read that I've already read and we've already kind of talked about and speculated that I don't even care about this story yeah. as much. I mean, we did have questions about like some of the gaps, you know, the, the parts that we were not getting mm-hmm. from exactly. the other one, but it's not like, but reading them apart, it does, it is harder to fill in those gaps. The most interesting part in this Cywar episode is, uh, or in the, where we're at is where Clark is back on the farm with Lana 
and he's having a memory and he and he gets attacked by um kenny braverman you know uh andy uh, anthony and desiato's uh favorite uh small boat character <clears throat> and then we have the kent show up and basically john kent we know it's wrong because he says uh how many times have i told you i regret the day that i ever found you that we should have just left you to die in that stupid rocket ship and you you know and we see like the snake imagery and i really like the the way the medusa mask is done with a lot of the snake imagery and everything in this and then it's like it keeps reverting back because then you see him being put in the the rocket as a baby with a snake um and then we see clark now superman crying with the with the psycho pirate over him with the medusa mask and then this is where lois shows up um as the blue energy johnny storm looking creature <laughs> yeah and it says for the full story check out superman volume four Cy war and then we jump to the next chapter which is the world of krypton part one which is funny because we actually read we read some Krypton stories in the other books and they took place further ahead. So this is going back further into the past on Krypton. And I'm just like, I'm like, why is this just not collected as its own trade? And cause then the next book is world of Krypton part four eradication. And I'm just kind of like, we've already done these stories. And we've already speculated. And then it ends with, you know, the world of Krypton part five. And I, I found this, I was excited about this one being a new creative team and where we started out with the hybrid story. Uh, the, that was, one, the world of Krypton has part one, part two, part three, part four, part five. Yeah. But I mean, like in this trade, it's one, three, and five. No, two is dissension. So I think these were back these must have been backups because they're only a few pages. Yeah. But I mean like, but in this trade, we don't get the full story. Oh, well, because part one we get discovery. Part two is dissension. Part so, three. Because I see like I'm looking at the I'm looking through the trade right here. Darkest depths. Are you looking in the trade or the individual issues? The trade. Because I'm like, I got the trade pulled up and it's like... Four is eradication. Are you seeing... Like, hold on. Part five is fortitude. Let me see here. Okay, I see. Okay, I missed where... Yeah, they must have They're, they're real quick. So I think they were backups and they put it all together as one story in the end of the trade. Okay, well, I retract what I just said because I missed part of it. I was trying to think about when I was yeah, reading like, it. I totally, I totally missed part three. Like, I'm going through now looking for, like the the markers. Yeah, yeah. The uh, like I said, I think when I was reading it, I was trying to. I think maybe you did the same thing I was doing when I was reading it. Was I was trying to. Where's I was thinking three? about fitting it into the other stories from before, but this is sure part this three is the part whole of this? story. Uh yeah, because he's, oh there it is. It's like the water under, one. Yeah, he's underwater. So it starts with him underwater in one, part one two. where he's at, but then part two, um, starts in the um, yeah there's in the in the council chambers. There's, yep, there's six there's six page backups. Yeah, it ends it underwater, and part three starts underwater again. And it kind of goes back and forth until the two sto- till, till the two sides collide. Which I like that in the trade. I'll take that back because that makes more sense. I apologize. But it just felt like I'm reading a trade of sporadic stories. And I can and- see how if you were reading it one, two, you know, over and over and over again, that once you hit this, it almost follows that same structure. But it, it is one story. What would you rate this trade overall? Um, you know, I mean, the stories. So the Lex Luthor story, I really enjoyed. I like that one the most. And then probably, honestly, the Krypton one at the end. Um, 
And then, you know, the little bits of Psy War, I mean, it was a good issue for the Psy mm-hmm. War, you know, going back through his memories. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Atomic Knights one, like you said, I mean, it was very high fantasy, high sci-fi. Um, it was cool. The art was great in all of these issues. Um, I mean, like, if I if I was to like rate it out of ten, I mean, as a as a whole thing, I mean, because of the lack of cohesion and just like a couple of random parts of some stories, I would say that the trade itself is like a seven. You know, I, I enjoyed everything here, but it wasn't complete. Yeah. Now I will let the listeners know that our next review, when we do the next one, we're doing volume five, which is what lies beneath. And um, then we're going to skip volume six. Because volume six is the action tie-ins to Doomed, which we covered when we talked about Doomed as a giant collective. And then seven, eight, nine is when we're going to start to get back on track with um, with Superman the story, especially because we have uh, action volume eight and Superman volume seven are both called The Truth. And they're going to line up and that's when we're going to read those together and be able to really talk about the story as it is. Um, and especially when we get to the last one, but making our way through this. And I, I love that at least on the, um, on the app, on the action side, they do have all the trades listed, you know, one through nine. Yeah. But then, but then on the Superman side, it is confusing and broken up. <laughs> absolutely but that's yeah i was i was a little disappointed in this one i'll be honest with you because i just i don't know i i i just remember reading the trades but i read so much of the new 52 trades at the same time i just remember it differently and going yeah. through this has been uh educational because i remember thinking oh i can just read this trade and get a story and the farther we get into it, you, you can't. Yeah. I like when I, when I started reading in the new 52, like I had read some issues and things, and then I had gotten to the point where I was reading the stories, like the, the, the events. Um, and then, uh, and then when DC universe came out, I, I was doing where I would read a line and I would hit an event. And then, um, you know, I would read, the event, but then it, then it would connect to other books. So then I'd go back and I'd read that whole book all the way up to the event book chapter. And then, and I do that. So I ended up reading a lot in a lot of different ways, you know, in, a, in mm-hmm. some different ways, really connecting and building up all those stories um, into the events. But yeah, if you were just like reading the character, the only, the character you like, like if we were only reading Superman books, you know, what, what do you get? And especially if you do this, this trade way, the, the trade versions here are really, <laughs> are really sparse, you know, I mean, it's almost best to, with the new 52 to try and collect the, the event books, the, the, the complete event books where you get all of the chapters like doomed or like mm-hmm. hell on earth or, or Psy war, you know, not the trades. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But all right, man, that that takes us down for the day. Our, we're making it through the New 52. Why? Because no one else is doing it, and we are talking about just the arc of how comic structure is and how tie-ins and crossovers can be positive, but the same thing can really be detrimental to when you're just trying to read a story. And this is why I think that Elseworlds and spinoff and mini series work so much better because going into ongoing storytelling it gets tough you absolutely having a, having a jump in point and stuff like that it it gets very difficult yeah ups and downs in the quality of the storytelling in the quality of the stories uh the entry points yeah number ones or 
Yeah, the the mini series, like you said, Elseworlds. Those are some of the ones that I really started to dive into and buy when I started to buy my trades and stuff. Yep. So I'm going to play this outro video because Solomon asked me to play this again. So here's our little outro. Check us out on all social media, Krypton Report. Here we go. Solomon. Don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe. I love it just because he's so young in that video. Yeah, right. <laughs> that little clip. Uh, find us on all major social platforms. Um, so for me and James, we just say, remember, and have a good, safe life. Tyler here. Hope you're enjoying the podcast today. I just want to talk about some another project I've really been working on. It's the Requel. It used to be just part of our Patreon, and we still do Patreon exclusives. But I've really pumped it up and I've had started inviting friends to join me as we pitch movie ideas. I, I ask everyone if they can go and check it out. It's under Jonathan Tyler Patrick on my YouTube and go like it, subscribe. And if you want to come on and pitch an idea, come on, just check it out. It's a fun time. I am Brian Peters, the creator and host of Gravely Amusing. For the past 30 years, I've studied the history of gods and monsters in pop culture and our world. As a student of theology and history, I've tried to understand evil and its impact on us. As a writer, I've tried to share this knowledge. As a comedian, I've tried to make people laugh as I do it. But as a man-child, I'm still that scared seven-year-old boy. Join me as I share the history of horror and sci-fi discuss classic and modern pop culture, and share a creepy story or two. This podcast may scare you, it may horrify you, or it may leave you gravely amused. Listen to Gravely Amusing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and wherever podcasts are found. Follow us on Twitter at Gravely underscore Amusing or on TikTok at Gravely Amusing. We have a $1 Patreon. Yes, I know everyone asks for money, but our $1 Patreon each month gets you commentary tracks for recent movies, DC movies. It gets you my requel series where I pitch ideas about movie sequels, prequels, or whatever. It also gets special bonus episodes. So check that out for $1 a month. That's all we ask. Keep it cheap, keep it simple, and help us keep going. Check out the link in the show notes or Patreon Krypton Report. And if you want to have a good time, keep listening to the Krypton Report. Look up in the sky. We want to thank you for checking out the Krypton Report podcast. And we ask you to check us out on all of our social media. On Twitter X, Facebook, Instagram, Blue Sky, Hive, Threads, YouTube. We're everywhere. And if you want to be a guest on the podcast, just send us a message and let us know. If you are like Tyler and James and can't get enough super talk, Check out these other podcasts, Digging for Kryptonite, Supergirl Radio, The Last Sons of Krypton, The Superboy Legacy Podcast, All-Star Superfans, Superman the Animated Podcast, The Aspiring Kryptonians, Always Hold On to Smallville, The Geek of Steel, and Truth, Justice, and Hope.